Chancellor. I am now honoured to present the degree of Doctor of the University Honoris Causa. Victoria University is proud to honour Susan Alberti AC. Susan would like to stand. For her outstanding service to the community through her philanthropy and advocacy for medical research, education and sport, especially her leadership in promoting women's sport. Her work as a role model and mentor for young women and her contribution to Victoria University as chair of the Victoria University Foundation. Dr Alberti was born in Bansdale and educated at Siena College. After leaving school, she worked for a legal firm and subsequently worked with her husband, Angelo, establishing the Dansu Group uh, as, an, uh, as an industrial and commercial builder and developer of industrial estates and business parks. Following her husband's death in 1995, she assumed control of the company, becoming one of the first women to obtain a commercial builder's licence in Victoria. Dr Alberti assumed the role of general manager after her husband's death and continued to grow the company. Her business success allowed her to devote more time to her private passion of philanthropy, in particular the cause of juvenile diabetes. For 30 years, the Susan Alberti Gala Ball raised valuable funds towards medical research, including finding a cure for type 1 diabetes. In 1994, she founded the Melbourne and Sydney annual Walk for the Cure around Albert Park Lake a significant annual fundraiser which to date has raised more than $30 million towards the search for the cure for diabetes. She was the national president of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation, JDRF, Australia, and in 1985, Dr Alberti was invited to join the international board of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation International, the JDFI. In 2008, she accepted an invitation to become JDRFI's first international patron. In November 2013, she retired from all positions associated with JDRF Australia and JDRI. Her community contributions extend far beyond diabetes research. In 2004, Dr Alberti became a board member of the Western Bulldogs Football Club. She subsequently became patron of the Western Bulldogs Football Club and founding co-chair of the Western Bulldogs Forever Foundation. In 2012, she became the Vice President of the club. She's been an outspoken advocate for the role of women in sport and has championed women's football having played as a young woman. A strong supporter of the Victorian Fo Women's Football League, the, w the VWFL Premier Division Cup is named the Susan Alberti Cup in her honour. She was awarded life membership of the Western Bulldogs Football Club in 2015 and is also president of the Footscray Football Club VFL team. Education is a passion of Dr Alberti and she has quietly supported scholarships for secondary school students over a long period and most recently became a supporter of the Western Chances Scholarship Program. As a director of the Victoria University Foundation, Dr Alberti has played a crucial role in the introduction of a unique model of scholarships, the Achievement Scholarships. Dr Alberti has helped shape the scholarship program and made the first significant gift to support the program. She has continued to support the program ever since, every year since their inception. In February 2014, Dr Alberti was elected chair of the University, Victoria University Foundation, having first joined as a director in 2009. Not only has she provided outstanding leadership to the foundation over that time, she has subsequently agreed to chair our centenary campaign. Dr Alberti has been a finalist in the Australian of the Year Award on two occasions. In 1997, she received an AM, and in 2007, she was awarded her AO. She was appointed a Companion of the Order of Australia in January 2016. In 2012, Dr Alberti won the Humanitarian Award at the fifth annual Gold Herald Awards, which honour achievements made by leading Australian individuals and organisations that have contributed to the health and well-being of Australia's children and young people. In 2013, she was a recipient of the Research Australia's Great Australian Philanthropy Award. She was inducted into the Victorian Honour Roll of Women and in August 2015, Dr Alberti was appointed a Director of the Australia Day Council by the Prime Minister, Tony Abbott. In recognition of her outstanding service to the community through her philanthropy and advocacy for medical research, education and sport, 
especially her leadership in promoting women's sport, her work as a role model and mentor for young women and her contribution to Victoria University as chair of the Victoria University Foundation, I present to you for admission to the degree of Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa, Dr. Susan Alberti. By virtue of the authority vested in me by the Council of Victoria University, I admit you to the degree of Doctor of the University, Honoris Causa. Congratulations. Congratulations. I'd now like to invite Dr. Alberti to deliver the occasional address. Vice Chancellor, Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, um, graduates, special guests, my family, my very special friends who are here tonight to join me. I'm absolutely delighted. I can't tell you how honoured I am this evening to accept this prestigious award. It means a lot to me. The last time I was at a celebration like this was my own daughter's graduation and it was so special and I know to all of the parents and, and graduates here tonight, you should be so very, very proud of yourselves. But who would have thought that the daughter of a policeman from Ashwood could have so many letters after their name? It has been a remarkable 12 months for me and in all the accolades I've received uh, after becoming a companion of the Order of Australia this year in January. And, and of course, tonight's honours, which just tops it all off, are all about promoting the causes that I most strongly believe in and feel very strongly about. Medical research, as was mentioned, particularly type 1 diabetes research, and St Vincent's Institute for Medical Research, where I chair that foundation. Women in sport, particularly women and the growth and development of the, of the of Aussie rules football for women. Yes, I'm a frustrated ex-footballer and it's like a dream come true. I had to hang up my boots at the age of 15 because there was nowhere to go. My brother's here with me tonight and I used to kick the football with him. But my father said I was being knocked around too much by the boys, so I had to hang up my boots. But I was a tough player and uh, I think I was a bit like Tony Liberatore. I was a very good... Um, uh, tackler. And I tell this story, I, I, I'm really sincere about this, but I was rushing to a board meeting at the Bulldogs a few years ago and a lady stopped me in the corridor and she said, I know you. I said, oh, well, I'm sorry, I don't you, know you. And she said, you broke my arm playing football. <laughs> there was no video replay then. Wasn't I lucky? So also, the mighty Western Bulldogs. Um, I'm so proud to be associated. And lovely to have the CEO from the Western Bulldogs, Dave Stevenson, here tonight. Dave, thank you so much for being here. I know you've got a very busy schedule. Lots of things happening at the club. Of course, Victoria University, I'm absolutely passionate about. And of course, um, the Western Hospital, where I sit on the board, Western Health. And Western Chances, yes, I support them as well. I'm a girl who's lived in the East all her life, and I've and, but my heart has always been in the west of Melbourne. And as you can see, all my interests are here in the west of Melbourne. And as I said, I'm very honoured to be here tonight for Victoria University. There are just to some of the few of the examples that um, I support. And I generally enjoy the feeling of helping others. Of course, it was not just those early days that made me the person that I am today. It's also events and personal circumstances that you encounter along the way. My only child, Danielle, was born in 1969. She was quite tragically diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. One minute I had a healthy, perfectly healthy child, good at school, good at sport, good at everything. A beautiful young woman. 20 years later, I was bringing her home to give her my kidney. Her kidney started failing because of complications. She died on the plane uh, next to me on a Qantas plane bringing her home. When Danielle died and she covered her with a blanket, I said to her, I will never, ever, ever give up trying to find a cure for this insidious disease. 
not realising that nine months later I would be hit with cancer and other um, sickness to the point that I had a 50-50 chance of my own of survival. And if it wasn't for medical science, I wouldn't be standing here tonight and congratulating all these wonderful young men and women. Uh, so I'm so grateful to medical science for giving me a cure. Uh, I'm in remission and I'm feeling pretty healthy and I thank all those doctors and researchers. But back to the beginning, that's a tragedy with my daughter that'll stay with me for the rest of my life. That um, happened about uh, just over a decade ago. But it, it's with me every day of my life. Faced with the unknown, when I was first told that Danielle was diagnosed with type 1, my immediate parental reaction was to seek advice and assistance with the natural expectation that uh, these, there would be quite simple and readily accessible solution available to me. I was quite surprised and ill-prepared to discover that juvenile onset diabetes, now known as type 1, then represented one of the many unknowns of medical science, as to a great extent it still does today. Do not get confused with type 1 and type 2. Type 2 can be managed with exercise and diet. We have a, an epidemic in this country of type 2 diabetes. We have about a million people diagnosed with type 2, probably another million undiagnosed, and about 145,000 young men and women with type 1 through no fault of their own. It's not because they ate too many lollies or too many cakes. It's because it's an autoimmune disease, and once they're diagnosed, it's for life. So try telling a 12-year-old, as my daughter was, that you had this for life. It wasn't a case of taking a few tablets. It was forever and then she relied on insulin to keep her alive. Um, this personal experience has set me on a quest to raise public awareness and funding for type one. My daughter, who had quite exceptional artistic talents, achieved significant success in her life. Her father, unfortunately, was killed in an accident, in a tragic accident, and she decided she'd go to the United States and complete her master's degree at Temple University. Unbeknown to me, she kept a master lot of that from me, her sickness from me, until I received that phone call to say her kidneys were failing. But Danielle was a very, very good student. She worked extremely hard. She never took no for an answer, and I was so proud of her. When I walked in here tonight and saw all these young graduates, it brought back memories of the dream that she had, and I want you all to continue with your dream, to be the best that you possibly can. She would have turned 47 this year, in November this year, and her death over more than a decade ago has only increased my determination to find a cure. So this occasion, this wonderful occasion and award is as much for Danielle, for Danielle and honouring her life as it is for me. That's why I was so delighted last weekend when the Turnbull government announced more than $54 million in funding for technology that subsidises the cost of monitoring blood glucose levels remotely for children and young adults with a diabetes. A lot of our children go to bed at night unknowing, not knowing that they're going to wake up in the morning because their blood sugar drops so low and they go into a coma and they die. It will, make, it will save Australian lives and make a difference to so many Australians, Australian children. And it's part of my motivation for standing up for causes that I, and individuals that I just believe deserve a fair go. You may have heard of the champion sprinter, Melissa Breen. After all, she's the fastest Australian sprinter, 100 metre sprinter in this country. She should be talked about. She should be on the back and front pages of the newspaper. After all, she did run the fastest 100 metre. It's for that reason that I supported her. I read about her in a newspaper article. Her mega funding was cut by Athletics Australia. I don't want to go into the politics, but it was cut. The cost, the money that she was being allocated would probably pay for the brakes and tyres on my car for one year. So that's another reason why I support scholarships, a range of scholarships and programs that help women participate at the highest levels in the sporting world and particularly in medical research. In my role as chairman of St Vincent's Institute Foundation, I've spent a lot of time with their scientists and researchers and gained an understanding of some of the unique challenges that they face with the constant pressure of applying for grants, government grants, juggling work-life balance and finding cures for the chronic diseases that all of us face. And I'm sure there's not a person in this room tonight that hasn't faced that or their family or, or colleague or friend. And we need these cures. One of the, as I say, one of the many pressures that, I mean, uh, that many women in research must deal with is raising a family while pursuing a scientific career. 
Maternity leave has come a long way since I was a young mum back in the 60s, bringing up my daughter, paying contractors, dealing with some very colourful characters, and running the family building and construction business. However, science and research is almost unique among the professions that it's quite difficult to have a baby and go on maternity leave whilst in the middle of a project. The Susan Alberti and uh, Medical Research Award began in 2013 and funds an assistant to help continue important research whilst a uh, scientist is on maternity leave. Just a fortnight ago, I awarded the fourth scholarship. The young woman, I think she was due to have the baby that day. I was so worried that we would have to have a midwife in the room, but she managed to get through the ceremony and she's now gone off to have her second child, knowing that there's a research assistant continuing her work. When she comes back, she slots back into her job and her research continues. I'm not a feminist in the popular sense, but I believe that football at all its levels gains its strength, its community involvement and its enduring success from the support and participation from the network of mothers, sisters and partners who work most often behind the scenes. I want to briefly just touch on women's football, which is another passion of mine, as I mentioned just before, and also uh, relates to my support for the Mighty West. At the Western Bulldogs, we're extremely proud that 50% of our members are females, with nearly half of our cheer squad are women. And of course, we have three female board members on the board, more than any other club in the AFL. Probably, you don't know, but I used to be in the cheer squad, and I think I must be the only director in the AFL who's come from a cheer squad. So I know what it's like to sit out there in the freezing cold with my brother, I did when I was a kid, the thirds, the seconds and the first, tear up telephone books, use the floggers, so I know exactly what it's like out there. And when I do go to the football now, whilst the lunch is rather lovely, the first thing I do is look for my seats because that's what I'm there for, to see the game. The, the club also, my, the Western Bulldogs also plays a very big role in supporting the, the Victorian Women's Football League. I support financially and through my public profile many of these initiatives in their start-up phases before they attract sponsors and resources. One such example is the annual exhibition match between two all-female teams, one representing the Western Bulldogs and the other the Melbourne Football Club, which has now been up and running for three years. The AFL estimates between five and 10,000 fans attend the games, which are held as curtain raiser to the clashes between the two senior men's games. I did suggest to Gillam McLaughlin that the men become the curtain raiser and the girls become the main, but that didn't go down too well, so I thought I'd better change the subject pretty quickly. So as a, young, as a young girl, I could only dream of being able to run onto the MCG. I used to beat my brother across the oval to get into the centre, to be there first. I used to jump the fence before the siren went off, so he didn't get there before me. But that was always a, a game Richard, you and I played to get to the centre of the MCG or the Witten Oval or the Western Oval. Finally, after many years of behind-the-scenes lobbying from me and many other fabulous people, we secured the annual event and the dreams of young female female footballers are finally becoming a reality. My foundation was the inaugural sponsor of the competition and will continue to play an important role in supporting the National Women's League competition. It's now up to all of us to take things to the next level. Nationally, I'm pleased that the, uh, the AFL have brought forward their timetable for a new Women's Football League. The inaugural Women's Football League will kick off with a two-month season in February and March of next year. Eight teams, it's anticipate, will compete over seven uh, home and away rounds and a final series in a standalone competition played prior to the AFL season commencing. It is expected that four teams will be based in Melbourne and I'm sure that it would surprise absolutely no one here tonight that I'm pushing strongly for one of those teams to be based at the Witten Oval and wearing the mighty red, white and blue. Applications to host, the, to, um, host a team closed in April. We'll find out very shortly which franchises will feature in the inaugural year of the league. I have no doubt that in 2017, the national competition will be a success and media companies broadcasting the game and spectators flocking to venues, inspiring the next generation of young female footballers who will finally have a national elite um, league to compete in. They will be eagerly anticipating the idea of playing on the biggest stage of all, the MCG. So again, Vice-Chancellor and Chancellor, I thank you from the bottom of my heart, and I really mean this, for bestowing this honorary doctorate on me. To all of you here tonight, con uh, graduating, congratulations, but 
let me tell you that the hard work of your university years is nothing compared to the school of hard knocks you're about to encounter. I encourage all of you, each and every one of you, to keep contributing and being the best that you can in your careers and what you can achieve and then give back to our city, state and this wonderful country of Australia and everything else that you do. Above all, work hard, believe in what you do and make the most of the outstanding opportunity we have to live in this great country, Australia. God bless all of you. Thank you, Dr. Alberti, and congratulations. I now again invite Anik Mataya, who graduated with the Bachelor of Exercise Science and Human Movement and the Bachelor of Psychological Studies to speak on behalf of the graduates. Anik achieved excellent academic results and has been heavily involved in the VU community, including roles as Secretary of the VU Psychological Student Society, Secretary of VU Sport and Exercise Science Student Society, VU Student Ambassador and Manager of the 